to kick him in the head and take him off guard and see that it's not size that matters. Hey everybody, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Here we are with episode 232, and today's guest is someone that started something that is almost ubiquitous in the martial arts, but you may not know it. I'm going to hold off on the name and just let you wonder for a few minutes. Don't worry, I'll introduce her. If you're new to the show, you may not know that you can check out everything that we've got going on at whistlekick.com. You can find all the show notes to this and the other 231, wow, it's amazing to say that, episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We have transcripts, we have photos, we have videos, we have all kinds of great stuff, links to the guests and what they've got going on. Really, if you're a fan of the show, you really should check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com at least from time to time to see the things that we're putting on there. We're trying to add value and give you all those links and book titles and everything because we know a lot of you are listening while you're doing other things and you don't have time to jot down notes or maybe it's unsafe. Maybe you're driving in a car, riding a motorcycle on a bicycle. Who knows what it is? We want you to stay safe and, of course, get on over. You can sign up for the newsletter while you're there. We email out that newsletter, honestly, once, twice a month. It's really infrequent. Sometimes we throw you a discount. Really, we're just trying to add some value, just maybe give you some additional information on what's going on at Whistlekick or give you some insight into what's happening with new products, colors on gear, you know, just all kinds of stuff. So check that out. And you can always unsubscribe if you don't like it. I write it myself. Our guest today is literally and figuratively not short of courage. Despite times when the deck was stacked against her, she managed to face and overcome everything life threw at her. Professor Melody Schumann wasn't a typical child. She got involved with some stuff which led to martial arts ultimately, and what I have to say is truly an exciting life, at least from my perspective. Her martial arts story is one of a kind, and rather me ramble on here, let's welcome her and listen as she tells us her story. Professor Schumann, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me. It is an honor. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for doing this. I know we're going to we're going to dig in and a lot of listeners already are going to know who you are because you're out there you're doing some great stuff and I appreciate all that you're doing. We're going to get into that. But before we can get into that, we've got to get some context for how we got to here. How did you get started as a martial artist? <laughs> uh, well, uh, my story is not your typical. I watched a uh, karate kid growing up as a little girl and wanted to take karate. Uh, my story goes being very small for my age. I got picked on a lot in school and I had a, uh, feisty little personality and I used to fight back, not physically, but, uh, in other ways where I made a lot of poor behavior choices. So my parents as a last ditch resort, put me in martial arts to teach me discipline and, uh, get my behaviors, uh, straightened up. So when I first started, I, I did not like martial arts. As a matter of fact, I hated it. And I cried the whole way to my classes. Uh, my instructor's name was Mr. Slaughter <laughs> and he was an ex Marine. And this was back in 1987 in New Orleans. So this was the the real dungeon dojo days where I was found myself in knuckle pushups a lot in class and the uh, the old school dead cockroach position, you know, where you you get put up with your feet up in the air and hands up in the air for long periods of time because of my poor behavior. So that's uh, that's really how it all started. <laughs> wow, you know, I, I was a a wrestling fan back as a kid and and. Slaughter just made me think of of Sergeant Slaughter, and if if he was anything like that character in wrestling, it's amazing that you made it beyond a single class. <laughs> well, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> when did that change? It, well, that's another great question. So my my brother, he's two years older than me, and he's my best friend. And he decided to join martial arts as well, just to kind of keep me company in class. And there was this older kid in class who was a total Johnny from Karate Kids, you know, good looking kid, total bully. And uh, he used to really mess with my brother a lot in class. And it was the very first day that we reached our, our green belts and we started sparring. And, uh, and I just wanted wanted to whoop him up and we started sparring and he kicked me in the stomach super hard and I caught myself and I I was just about in verge of tears, but I didn't want him to see me cry. 
So I just, with all my might and effort and energy, just popped up a round kick and whacked him in the head super, super hard. And I was extremely flexible, so it was really cool that I kicked him in the head. And I stopped and I looked over and I see my mom in the audience and my mom just jumps up in the air, just starts screaming, cheering for me that I kicked him in the head. And I was sitting there going, man, I get to kick boys this particular bully in the head. And uh, not only do I get to kick him in the head, but everybody cheering is cheering for me, especially my mom, who's usually yelling at me. This is the coolest sport ever. <laughs> and uh, ever since that day, I really loved sparring. I, I started falling in love with martial arts. <laughs> wow. What, what was it? So how, how old were you when that happened? I was 11. Okay, so you're, you're 11, which is a transitional age for nearly everyone. I mean, we can probably say... Everyone. Oh yeah. <laughs> what what was it in that moment? I mean, you know, you you you've had plenty of time to to think about that, to reflect on that moment. But what was it in that moment that you got that you needed? Was it validation? Well, was it power? It was, I was always an underdog because I was very tiny for my age. So I, the, you know, a really quick backstory is my father had been anxious to get me into this all girl Catholic school, St. Scholastica Academy in New Orleans. He graduated from brother Martin Valedictorian, Victorian, which is the all boy Catholic school. And finally they got me in and uh, this was in the fifth grade. And I walk into my class and all the girls go, who let the kindergartner in? And of course I turn around and look to see where the kindergartner was and realize that they were talking about me. Uh, so you can imagine sports activities, things like that. Uh, nobody was picking me. And so for me to be really, really petite and really tiny and this, this big, taller, good looking kid who was very athletic in our martial arts class, he was winning all the tournaments to kick him in the head and take him off guard and see that it's not size that matters, but it's heart that matters. That's really what did it for me because I moving on from there, I started competing in tournaments and, uh, and of course forms was my, my forte. That's what I won world champion in, but, uh, in sparring in our organization, we competed based on age, not by size. So if I lost, it was all oh, that poor little girl lost. But when I won boy it was the audience cheering for me and strangers, you know, they would see this little girl sparring this bigger boy or bigger girl, uh, back in the day. And, and I loved being the underdog and I loved winning and, and getting all these accolades, uh, based on my heart and not on my size. Mm. Cool. It's something I can relate to certainly being smaller and, and, and that, that transitional moment, that realization that I had a lot more capacity to succeed within the dojo than I had realized. And certainly you and I are not the only ones who have had that experience. I'm sure a lot of the folks listening have had that, you know, they're probably thinking, oh, I remember my moment as well. So that's great. And obviously you continued, you started competing, you started winning. What was it about martial arts that kept you hooked? Because you're still pretty, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm underselling it. You're rather involved still. Yes, yes, I, I'm extremely involved. Um, what was it that kept me hooked? The, the martial arts to me, you know, you're always constantly improving yourself. Even now, I'm 41 years old. I'm in the best shape of my life. Uh, right now, I'm covering for our kickboxing instructor. It's a, you know, it's, it's a fitness kickboxing class in the mornings. And I've been teaching that class for the last two weeks. And I just feel myself constantly getting stronger, getting more powerful. Even yesterday, yesterday was Labor Day weekend at the time of this recording and we were out on our boat. Of course, I'm in a bathing suit and we came over to a, a friend's house and I hadn't seen them in like six months. And they were like, wow, what are you doing? You're just in such great shape. And, uh, you know, it all revolves around martial arts and that training. It just, it's a, it's a fun, artful activity that also, also helps you become a better version of yourself. Mm. I love it. Now, of course, in that backstory, we, we heard a few, tangents, stories, elements that make you who you are. And I love the stories. They're my favorite part of what we do here. If I was to ask you your favorite martial arts story, what would that be? <laughs> okay. So in 1997, uh, this is when I was 21 years old. I was on the uh, world demo team in the ATA and we traveled to South Korea 
And at the time, I was very well known in in my organization for being a great children's martial arts instructor because uh, I I used to work at Disney in entertainment, and I pulled a lot of animation and entertainment type of personality into my teaching. So while we were in Korea, we were at a martial arts school, and they had these preschoolers who were taking class. And now this is in 97. So back then, most martial arts schools didn't work with kids under the age of seven, right? Because the younger kids are just very hard to deal with uh, behavior-wise and curriculum-wise. It doesn't really target their stage of development. So anyway, we're watching these preschoolers take class, and my one of my masters comes over and tells me, he goes, I want you to teach, teach them some drills and teach class. And I was like, all right, awesome, bring it. So I jump on the mat, and I look at all these kids. Now, again, we're in South Korea, just so I tee it up. And I look at all the little kids, and I said, okay, guys, line up. And they all just kind of look at me, and I was like, um, okay, everybody, stand up. And still no motion from any of the kids. And I look over at my master, and I said, do they speak English? And he goes, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. So I kind of look around the room, and it was also a, a gym type of, of facility, and it had like jumping ropes and hula hoops and blocks and all these things. And I was like, I got an idea. So I just started setting up all these obstacle courses and all these kind of like game-like activities and just kind of started doing them and having the kids follow along. And they were having a blast to the point where my master taps me on the shoulder and goes, uh, it's been an hour. You need to stop now. <laughs> and I was like, an hour's gone by now. He goes, yeah. And I said, how long was I supposed to teach drills? He's like, well, just for like 10 minutes or so. But you, everybody was so entertained and all the parents came in and all the parents were enjoying it. So we didn't want to stop you. And uh, that was the birth of me really finding my feet into the children's martial arts education because the plane ride home, it was 18 hours from Seoul to Chicago, which is where we landed in the U.S. I ended up writing a preschool martial arts curriculum for my school because, like I said, we didn't have kids under the age of seven. So I wrote this program for three to six-year-olds, and I called it Little Ninjas. And if you're a listener and you've heard of Little Ninjas, uh, that was how the Little Ninja program was born. So the you know the, that was my favorite story, just not being able to communicate with these preschoolers. So I had to figure out a way to teach them some drills and make it fun by using this play-based learning, this game-based learning concept, mm. which at the time was very, was very uncommon in the typical martial arts school. Sure. So was this, can, can I use the word accident? Was that what it was? Or was this the evolution of distinct skills that you had that just, it happened to coalesce at that time. And even if it hadn't, then it would have, it would have some other time. I mean, well, how you do know, you look at it? I, I call it serendipitous luck. That is one of the words that I use a lot, uh, especially when I, with my coaching clients and serendipitous luck is basically when hard work and opportunity meet. So I really had been harnessing a lot of personality and entertainment type of uh, teaching strategies when working with my students. And that's why our school was so successful. And then the opportunity to teach children in another country and uh, be inspired by my ability to educate them and entertain them without using a word of of com- verbal communication, uh, that's, that's how it all, I, it all developed. So everything that happens to me now is still all that part of that serendipitous luck, because after that, not too shortly after that, I was taking, I was in NAPMA, remember NAPMA back in the day, and I was on, on a, on a cruise taking their cardio karate certification with Jim Graydon. And we just went to lunch after our certification on the cruise. And I was telling him about this program I wrote and, uh, he was like, Oh my gosh, you have to come teach it at my school because he was only an hour and a half away. So I implemented the program in his school. And it just so happened that the vice president of NAPMA was taking kickboxing one day when I was teaching that class. And that was Rob Kawasante. And uh, Rob Colasante was like, man, this is something. So he scheduled a meeting with John Graydon, who was the president of NAPMA. And next thing you know, Little Ninjas is in 2,000 schools in dozens of countries all around the world. So, um, yeah, serendipitous luck. <laughs> wow. And what luck it was, because it's completely changed not only – well, I'm, I'm going to speculate that it's changed your life, but I know <laughs> it's changed the lives – of a lot of people in the martial arts. It's changed a lot of schools. And I'm going to guess that it's brought profitability to some schools that might have been on the, the edges prior. 
That's that was the the greatest benefit of the Little Ninja program was traveling all around the world and having school owners tell me that they were able to leave their morning job or their full time job and become full time martial arts school owners because it opened up such a lucrative niche market that they didn't have. And uh, not only with the students, you know, the younger generation of students, but then it was filtering in other their older siblings and so forth. So, yeah, definitely. It was such a what a great um it was such an honor to hear those stories and so very rewarding. Uh, just just the stories alone uh, made me really find my grasp and find my grip in the industry. Mm. One last question about this and then we'll move on. When you were writing that, when you're on that 18-hour plane ride back from Seoul, did you have any idea that what you were writing would become this? <laughs> you know, I, I did not. Um, I, I hoped that it would provide me a new passion in my own school because at the time we had a very successful martial arts school, but we were, we were having those roller coaster classes where students were dropping out mid level. The older ones were dropping out because the classes were too easy. Younger kids were dropping out because classes were too hard. So I was getting frustrated teaching every single day and I almost quit martial arts. So when I was writing this program, I was hoping that it was going to give me this this new passion to stick with it because I was 21 I was in I was taking business classes at night and I wasn't really sure if I was going to stay in the martial arts industry or not uh, because I, I, I was finding myself so stressed out and I didn't want to have a stressed out career for the rest of my life so um, I did it but boy uh, it, it definitely was life-changing <laughs> awesome that's certainly clear and I'm sure that as we go on we're gonna loop back and, and tie into some of this. When you're not involved in martial arts, so when you're not coaching or, or teaching or training or writing or any of the other things that we can put under the heading of martial arts, what do you like to do? Do you have hobbies? Do you have time for I, hobbies? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, my hobbies are basically come first. <laughs> We're not hobbies, but um, let's just say my family comes first. Obviously, I have a son who's two and a half years old. His name is Van, and he is my world. So when I'm not working, I am either swimming with my son, I'm on the boat with my son. We have a boat. Uh, we go out several times per week uh, over here. I'm taking him to parks. We're just having a good time. Uh, for But for my personal self, my other hobbies is I, I, I'm big into golf. So I love to do golf. I do a lot of golfing. And I'm a, I'm a big gym girl too. So I like to work out uh, sometimes twice a day. <laughs> Uh, just it's it's a way to clear my head, and it's also a way to help me stay empowered. Love it, love it. What do your workouts look like? Uh, well, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I do Skills Fit, which is a uh, fundamental interval training kickboxing program that uh, we have a genius lady, Michelle Cowling, wrote. And uh, so those are those are my great cardio uh, and bag workouts. But when I'm in the gym, I, you know, I do a little bit of a pre-core to warm up my muscles. And then I'm alternating leg days, arm days, and uh, hitting free weights on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And if I do skills fit and then I go to the gym, then I'm working on the machines. Great. Okay. One of the things that I love to discuss on the show is how people's martial arts background has helped them in, in just general life. And one of the ways that I think we can best exemplify that is to talk about a time where things weren't good. You know, it could be a, a difficult moment in time or a difficult time in your life. But if you'd be willing to tell us about one of those and how your martial arts helped you get through it. <laughs> well, this is kind of a, um, a, a, a roundabout story, but I, well, when I moved to Florida, when I was 14 years old, I lived in New Orleans, as I mentioned, and I was in freshman in high school. And, you know, this back then, even nowadays, I mean, it's getting a lot cooler than it was back in the day, but martial arts wasn't very cool in high school. And I, didn't, I couldn't really find a, a martial arts school that I liked in Orlando when we moved here to Florida. So I dropped out. And I got into soccer and I got kicked off the team for, again, getting picked on on the field and making some bad choices. 
Uh, and so I, I stopped doing any kind of sports and activities and I just really started to rebel. And one day I was in the cafeteria and I sprayed pepper spray in the cafeteria just to mess with some people that I didn't really like and got, was in the office getting expelled for bringing a weapon to school. If you can imagine, I sent a counselor and a student to the hospital and I felt really bad about it. So I'm in the office and it was, it was a struggle because my parents were in New Orleans at the time on vacation. So they didn't know what to do with me. They had me sitting in the principal's office trying to decide on whether or not they were going to expel me or suspend me. And Disney happened to be there. And they were hiring for food and beverage because for the holiday season. And the manager, she felt bad for me. And she came over and I told her the story and how they didn't know what to do with me at the time. And she said, well, you know, why don't you get a job and tell your parents good news, bad news? You know, bad news is I got suspended, but good news is I got a job. And I said, well, I don't want to work in food and beverage. You know, I'd love to work in entertainment. Uh, and she said, well, you know what? You're short enough to work in entertainment because <laughs> there's a size requirement for the uh, for the entertainment position that I was looking for. And she asked me if I had any acting experience. And I told her, nope, I didn't have any acting experience. And she said, oh, well, no, Disney hires people who've had childhood backgrounds in acting and performing. So that wouldn't work. And I told her, I was like, well, you know, I, I'm a black belt. And at the time I was a national champion uh, in, in sparring and in forms. And she thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So she called her boss. And the next day I had a six hour private audition at Disney. And uh, so being a black belt and a national champion got my foot in the door at Disney. But then the composure of being able to audition for six hours, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it weren't for all of those testings that I had to do, you know, getting up, performing on forms, breaking boards, sparring, you know, working. You're best measured by how you handle yourself under pressure. And I had failed my black belt testing twice because uh, I made a lot of mistakes and I could, couldn't break my boards. But after I passed my black belt testing, I became more empowered and more confident in my abilities. And I got that job because I nailed my audition and they were so impressed with my composure because at the time I was only 17 years old and they hadn't seen a 17 year old have that much composure during an audition, especially somebody who didn't have any kind of acting background. So that I have to say is really uh, one that's, that's the beginning of how martial arts really helped my composure. Mm -hmm. A six hour. Uh, you called it an audition. Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm just. I'm just. I'm drawing a lot of correlations between <laughs> what I'm imagining happened there and a black belt test. Yes. Lengthy, high pressure. W yes. What else? Are, what else can you tell us? Because a, as well, with a black belt test, I'm, there's probably things that happen that aren't public. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, they, they, there was choreographed routines, so they would teach me a choreographed routine for about 30 minutes, and then they'd give me 10 minutes to practice it on my own, and then I'd get up and I'd perform it. And then they'd give me these acting type of routines where they would teach it to me, and then they'd give me a couple of minutes to practice it on my own, then I would get up and I would perform it. So the performance part of, of being able to, number one, learn something and then turn around and spit it back out with my own little flair, that's, it, there's a lot of correlations to what we do in martial arts. So what's going on in your head there? You've, you've just been suspended from school. You know your parents are going <laughs> to be unhappy. If, if I'm constructing any kind of accurate picture of who you, are, who you were as a teenager, you're probably feeling some anxiety about that. You know, it, I, 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 you would think that I was, but I just, no. I loved the entire process. Mm -hmm. I just wanted that job so bad. And I remember when I was moving from New Orleans and telling all my friends, you know, goodbye. And they're like, yeah, but you're moving to Orlando. And I was like, I know I'm going to work at Disney one day. I just had this drive and this, this, this over, overwhelming confidence that I had the part. And a lot of that is because of martial arts. And a lot of that is just from my, 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 my overwhelming ego that I had as a, as a child. So I'm sure that there was anxiety, but I do vividly remember how confident and how, how driven I was to get that job. Mm. And of course it happened. Yes, it, it, it happened. So it was a good news, bad news when my parents came home. <laughs> yeah. What did, what did they say? That's I, I'm, I'm curious. 
they could not believe in it. As a matter of fact, uh, they, they stood up for me because they wanted to expel me, but they just went ahead and suspended me. So my parents had to go to the school board and they had to plea to not, not expel me for bringing a weapon to school. It was pepper spray. It was a stupid choice. So to see my parents proud of me for getting this awesome job and that, uh, that pride they had for me really made it, it, you know, it swung the table over to my side where they went to bat for me to keep me from getting expelled in school too which is pretty cool. <laughs> so there's a lesson to any children that are listening out there. If you're going to do something that you shouldn't do, make sure you follow it up by something really amazing. So hopefully it evens out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I love it. Now, if I was to ask you who the most influential person on your martial arts has been, who would that be? Do you mean a person that I've met or anybody just in general? Anybody. It could be someone you've met or someone that even is a fictional character. Well, um, growing up, my, my uncle, my mother's brother, he was, he was handicapped. He was a special needs person. Uh, he was a lot older than me, but he was never able to live, live on his own. So he always lived with my grandmother and my grandmother and my grandfather were, were my best friends. So I used to spend a lot of time hanging out at their house and especially with my uncle Danny and my uncle Danny was a big Kung Fu star. He was a big Jackie Chan fan. Uh, Drunken Master was his favorite movie. And I used, I used, we used to watch that movie over and over and over again. And I just, I really got my passion for technique by watching Jackie Chan movies with my uncle. And, um, so I would say that if anybody, when I was growing up and I was, and I really found my grip in martial arts and I was loving it, Jackie Chan was the one who I idolized. I idolized the technique and his sidekicks. I idolized his intensity. And because he was a small person as well, um, he has to be one of the most influential people in my life as far as, um, the art form. Have you met him? No, not yet. Okay. And I say not yet because one day I will meet him. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 traveling in some big circles, and it would surprise me if that didn't happen <laughs> soon. Cool. And if I was to ask you who you would want to train with, and I, I suppose it could be the same answer, but oh, perhaps yeah. not. Who would you want to train with? And anywhere in time, anybody that you, you know, could imagine. You know, I'm sure everybody says Bruce Lee uh, because of his, his philosophy and how much of a genius he is. But the Jackie Chan, because he was the one who I used to watch him in the movies. And uh, again, his technique, I'm a technician and I won world champion in forms. That was my, my biggest title that I ever won. And uh, because I like technique, so he would be the one. So if you're listening and you have connections to his agent or family or him himself, uh, hook me up. <laughs> And then once that happens, please hook us up because he is certainly on the short list for coming on here. Awesome. He's, he's fantastic and, and had quite the influence on my upbringing as well. Now let's talk more about competition. Okay. You've talked about these titles. You've talked about your passion for competition. But let's go back to the most basic of, of questions there. Why? Competition seems to be such a polarizing thing for folks and Anybody that's a long-time listener to the show knows my feelings on it, but why did it become such an important part of your life? I, I believe that competition is really how you measure yourself. Win, or, win, lose, or draw, you become a better version of yourself because of the energy and effort that it takes to compete. You know, there's a lot of practice involved. There's a lot of detail involved. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of ups, but there's also a lot of downs. And I believe that my martial arts career was defined based on my competitions. So as a when as a younger girl, when I started getting into martial arts, the, the best memories I have with my family were traveling to martial arts tournaments and going to these competitions and seeing my friends. You know, this is back in the day where we didn't have text message, social media, cell phones, email, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So we would see our friends from Florida, from from all over the United States when we go to these competitions and we'd all hang out and have a good time. So it wasn't just about the actual competitions. But again, going into the com competitions, the, the highs when I would win championships and titles, 
my confidence and my own abilities would soar. And I never really wanted to be that person. Even now today, I don't use the fact that I'm a female in a male dominated industry as an excuse. I don't use my size as an excuse. Uh, it's all, it's all based on my, my heart and my passion and my desire to succeed. And a lot of that was, was born through competition. And so as you're traveling around, you're, you're competing, you're, you're doing all of these amazing things. How did that change you? Well, it, again, it, it was, it all, it established my confidence. It taught me how to handle defeat. Uh, I, my best quote that I tell my students even today, especially when they're getting ready to test for their black boat is you're not measured best by how you are on your easy days. You're measured best by how you handle yourself under pressure. How do you handle yourself on your worst days? It's one thing to be in a great mood and do great things when it's your birthday or Christmas is next week and you're excited, but how do you handle yourself when, when you lose? How do you handle yourself when your car breaks down or you get in an accident or, you know, you have uh, appliance arm get in in your home and and you're frustrated you know those are the days that really define you and, and competition is all part of that i'll give you another great story Please. i'm 21 years old and i'm in las vegas for for nationals and i'm sparring the reigning world champion i just moved up to to third degree black belt and uh this girl was my idol back in the day I used to watch her compete so here i am competing for competing with her for first place and we're tied four to four, and it's in sudden victory. Now, I, this is in Vegas again, I'm 21 years old, and I left my mouthpiece uh, back in Port Charlotte, this is when I lived in South Florida. So I had to buy a mouthpiece before my competition. And of course it was an adult sized mouthpiece and it didn't fit my mouth, I have a tiny, tiny jaw. And here we are tied four, four, the time stops, we're in sudden victory. My gums are all bleeding from this mouthpiece that doesn't fit my mouth, so I spit the mouthpiece out on the floor. And the ref looks at me and says, you need to put that back in your mouth. And I was like, I'm not putting that back in my mouth. It's on the carpet at this convention center where all these dirty feet have been. So that's not going to happen. And he looks over at my coach and says, hey, it's going to be up to you. Let her fight her or, or she has to uh, forfeit. And he's like, let her fight. She's got this. So he says, go, and I'm ready to go in and score the point. And this girl threw this back side kick and hit me square on the side of the jaw. And uh, I spit out what feels like rocks out of my mouth. And it was uh, four of my teeth, two of my front teeth, and two, one on my bottom uh, jawline and one on the other side. I don't know how that tooth got knocked out. So, and of course I lost, but not only did I lose, but now I'm in Vegas for the next few days missing teeth. <laughs> and uh, of course I stayed in the hotel room the entire time because I didn't want to go out with missing teeth or anything. But it taught me, it taught me one of my biggest lessons. It taught me a lot about humility and it taught me a lot about making stupid choices. And, uh, and that story right there, really, it doesn't get any worse than that. <laughs> so, you know, it really shifted my mindset to, to see things in a, in a positive life, like no matter what happens to you, you know, you get kicked in the face, you get teeth knocked out, you, you move on. And uh, interestingly enough, I, I beat her at uh, world championships and ended up uh, taking bronze um, not too long later. Uh, but still, I have to go to the dentist once once a year to uh, have my have my teeth, you know, still worked on because she did so much damage to my jaw. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, well, we, we don't need to talk about the <laughs> the horrendously sharp edged irony of that moment <laughs> because that's about as ironic as you get. So we're not going to go there because what, what is there to say that isn't already understood? <laughs> but I want to talk about your confidence in facing your idol. I think most of us that come up in the martial arts, we, we have at least one person, multiple people, oftentimes, sometimes it's our instructor that we look at and say, that person, that person is amazing and I want to be like them someday, but to step up and be, I mean, for all intents and purposes, you were on a peer level, even in that moment, four, four, sudden death, it's about to go down. <laughs> Did you realize in the moment how big of a step that had been for you? Apparently not because I didn't block. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I, I, it was, it was amazing because, uh, you know, the, the girls third degree black belt division in the organization was, a, was a, an extremely popular division because there were some just great, great fighters and our ring was crowded. And I feel bad for everybody who was competing around us because of all the cheers that were coming up from our ring. So it was really exciting to be tied four four and have all these people there. And I was think I, I thought for sure I was going to win. <laughs> so I, I had this, I had too much confidence and I was like, this is it. It because you know when I again because of my size she was a lot bigger than me she was like five eight like 140 pounds and here I am five nothing 90 pounds soaking wet so I was like you know if I lose and everybody's like oh man she put up a good fight but if I won you know I was victorious I was going to go down as a legend uh in in martial arts in my in my organization um so yeah my overconfidence really got the best of me in that one so it wasn't always a bed of roses <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking as a smaller man, I can certainly appreciate that. You know, you, you almost can't lose in that kind of a scenario because, exactly. oh, well, you can just play it off. That person was bigger than me or, or something like that. But it doesn't change the fire for the, those of us that are competitive. I think you and I are That's certainly right. similar in that way. Let's talk about movies. Okay. You love Jackie Chan, so I'm going to guess some of his movies have made it through a few rotations on your television over the years? <laughs> yes. Yes. Still won't let my son watch them, but yes, definitely. Jackie Chan is uh, one of the places, one of the movies that is my go-to when, uh, if I'm home alone and, and a Jackie Chan movie's on, I'm stopping. <laughs> it's hard to move past that, isn't it? <laughs> yes. What's your favorite movie? Favorite martial arts Drunken Master. Okay. Drunk, Drunken Master. You're not the first to name that on the show, but I'm curious <laughs> of your reasons why. I, I, because you got to remember when I watched Drunken Master with my uncle, my uncle Danny, who was 20 years older than me at the time. Um, and again, I, as I mentioned, my uncle Danny, you know, he was, he was, he was handicapped. He was, he had special needs. He was just a funny dude. So we would just, you know, as a younger girl seeing him drunk and still beating up people, I just thought it was the funniest thing. <laughs> Are there any other movies that hold a special place for you? I... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the original movie. Yeah. Yeah. I used to want to be uh, Ernie Reyes Jr., the pizza delivery boy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And if, if you had to be one of the turtles, which one? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a nunchucks girl. I'm really, really, really good with nunchucks. So I, I like Michelangelo, but I'm also, I like the leadership position. So, you know, it's a tie between Leonardo and Michelangelo. All right. You know, that should, that should almost become a question because I think every martial artist knows which Ninja Turtle that they most identify with. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Some quiz. We'll, we'll put out a quiz on Facebook. Then, tell you yeah, which Ninja Turtle you are. You know, it's, 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 it's interesting that you say that because we just had our big, um, we, you know, our skills organization, we just had our annual conference here in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I hired Ernie Jr. as our keynote speaker. Oh, cool. So he came down and hung out with us the whole weekend and we do it, we, we, we make it a gathering. So nobody leaves the hotel. We hang out at the resort the entire time. And Ernie and his wife hung out with us the entire time, even at the beach bars and stuff. And it was really cool having people come over to our table, you know, while we were hanging out and saying, Oh, you know, this one was my favorite turtle and, and bringing their, like bringing their items, their posters of Ninja Turtles and, and saying who their favorite was. So yeah, that definitely should be a question because, um, I couldn't believe how many of our skills members were such huge Ninja Turtle fans. Yeah. Yeah. There was nothing like it when it came out and it certainly did a lot for the martial arts for getting another round of kids interested. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned Jackie Chan. You've mentioned Mr. Reyes. You've mentioned Bruce Lee. Are there any other martial arts actors that you look at and you say, yes, that that person, I love, you know, their skill or their choreography or something? Well, believe it or not, I was also a big fan of Bloodsport growing up. Yeah. <laughs> How can you not be? <laughs> so Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, was another one who I just, I, you know, I had the big girl crush on <laughs> growing up as a, as, as a little girl. His, uh, he, 
at, at, between Jackie Chan and John Claude Van Damme's sidekick, you know, my that was my favorite kick. My signature kick was the jump sidekick. And, you know, every time we did demonstrations, I would jump over a bunch of kids breaking a board with a jump sidekick. So he's another one that stands out. I know that you're your typical traditional martial artist, but for me, uh, I got to keep it real. <laughs> well, I'm right there with you. I think. I personally was responsible for wearing out the VHS copy at the local <laughs> convenience store where we would rent them. And I distinctly remember my mother rewinding certain parts um, and not so much the action scenes. Uh, you know, you weren't the only one that had a crush on them. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> a man crush. Yeah. Well, no, no, it was her. It was all her. I, mean, oh. I, I liked the scale. She was, okay. she was the one with, with a crush gotcha. on Van Damme. I mean, <laughs> You know, I, mean, I, I wouldn't mind being able to do that split even now. No, no. <laughs> How about books? You've written books. Are there books that you look at and you say, this book is, is so solid, so worth reading as a martial artist that you might want to share? Uh, well, believe it or not, I, I have several martial arts books, but I've never been able to get through any of them. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not really sure if I have a good enough explanation on why I have it. You know, I have the way of martial arts. I got the art of Jeet Kune Do. I've got the book of five rings. Um, but I, the books that I like are, are all into science and psychology, uh, particularly as it relates towards children, because traditional martial arts, as much as I loved it for myself, it, it wasn't my passion for what I felt was going to be my purpose in my career. And I believe that children's martial arts education is, is it's definitely transforming. I, I believe I personally have a hand on that uh, um, as a humble brag, but children learn best through play. They learn according to their stage of development. So everything that I wrap my head around as far as it comes to reading and researching is going to be more into the psychology, the Daniel Goleman, emotional intelligence, Daniel Siegel with Mindsight, uh, books like that. Okay. Yeah. And what, what is it about those martial arts books that, I mean, they're, they're classics and they're books that they're mentioned on the show quite often. And you're not the only one who struggles to, to get through them all the way. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hitch my horse to your wagon there. Any thoughts on why? Because it, well, it depends, you know, because everybody's personality is different, right? You know, some people read for entertainment. Um, my form of entertainment is more going out, working out, going on the boat, playing golf and so forth. So when I read, I want to read to learn. And the things that I want to learn all are based around what I do right now as a career. And that's being a children's martial arts consultant. So I read things that are going to help me translate better to my audience how to teach children in a way that's more productive, that's measurable, that's going to get better results so that they can in turn become better martial arts instructors to children. So a lot of the typical martial arts books that you have, uh, they, they don't really revolve around that concept. So, you know, that's, I guess that's my best way to say it. Okay. Now I know you've got a lot of materials out there and, and we're going to, we're going to talk about how people can find what it is you've got going on if, if they're interested in you know, developing a stronger children's program. But before we, we wrap up these last few questions, it seems like a good time. What's one thing that people that teach kids should stop doing? And what's one thing that people that teach kids should start or focus on? Well, it, it's hard to tell tell somebody that they should do something because I, I, I don't think that it's I deserve the right to say this is how things should be. But I could tell you what is working best based on all the feedback and based on everything that I've been doing with all my research. And uh, that is focus more on believing that children can will, will embrace discipline, will embrace hard work, will embrace the ethics of, of learning and improving themselves with a positive mindset. See, there's, there's two types of theory and martial arts instructors as it pertains to working with children and not just martial arts instructors, but people in general. So the theory, and this Douglas McGregor came up with this theory. He's a, he's a, he's a um, child psychologist or a psychologist. And he said the theory X people are you, typically are your traditional martial artists instructors. Theory X people are more authoritative. They believe that children need to be coerced. 
They need to be threatened. They need to be punished and held accountable when they make mistakes. So, for example, if you go into some of the martial arts communities, particularly on Facebook, and you see somebody say, hey, I got this kid who just can't sit still. He spins around. He interrupts in class. You know, what do I do? Theory X people are going to be the first to jump in and say, give him push-ups, put him in timeout, tell him if he doesn't behave, he's not going to get his belt, take away his stripe, uh, and those types of things. And, and that can be very retroactive, particularly for the average children in today's society, right? Uh, so it's a very militaristic mindset, and, and it's only effective on a very small majority of children. And the other ones, it, again, it's retroactive. Theory Y people believe that if you use positive teaching strategies, that you can get them to sit still without threatening them, without punishing them, without giving them push-ups. I'll give you a perfect example. I believe in the full moon. I'm sure if you, if you work with children, <laughs> it's martial arts, you believe in the full moon. And yes. I'm teaching a group of five and six-year-olds one day. And it was a full moon. And, of course, the kids were just out of whack. And uh, I look over in the audience and I'm looking at the parents and the parents just feel bad for me. You could see it in their eyes. They're just like this poor girl's going down fast. And I grabbed all the kids and I brought them in and I said, hey, guys, you see your moms over there? You see your moms and dads and your parents and everybody watching us? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, well, well, you guys are wiggling and you're moving around and you're not really trying hard and paying attention. You're making me look bad. So what I need you guys to do is can you do me a favor and make me look good? So when we go back to this drill, can everybody stand still in line and sit still and try 100 percent and make me look really good? Because if you make me look good in front of your parents, they'll keep bringing you. And they're like, yeah, 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 I can do that. And it worked. As a matter of fact, H2 started wiggling a little bit and Abby kind of nudged H2 and said, H2, you're making Master Melody look bad. And they tried so hard for the rest of the class. And the parents came over to me afterwards and said, what did you say to them? So again, it's that theory why mindset is if you know how to talk to them in their language, they will give you better discipline. They will give you better focus. But you have to have that theory why mindset, that mindset that using things like prompting good behavior, uh, the concept of healthy competition, the hierarchy of intrinsic motivation, all these uh, uplifting positive teaching strategies are going to be way more effective than taking away their belt, giving them push-ups, kicking them out of class, putting them in timeout, those types of things. Really well said, and certainly it, it hopefully it's changing. It seems like it might be changing based on my visits to schools and traveling around, but that theory X mindset, as you called it, is certainly what's been entrenched in the martial arts for a very long time. And I think that we're starting to transition. We are. We are, and for I sure. Think that's great. Because, yes. hey, if we don't keep them in martial arts, they're not going to get any of the good stuff out of it. That's right. If we look to the future, what is it that's keeping you motivated? You're, you're clearly an, an active participant in the martial arts in a whole variety of layers, and you're excited about it. You're motivated. Why? What are, what are you striving for right now? Well, I, I am in the process of building a new franchise format. And it's going to be it's going to have children's martial arts education involved in it. And I really want it to be one of the number one franchises for child enrichment. Uh, and I don't see any reason why it can't be. So that's what's getting me very, very, very excited about the future. We've got some really big players outside of the martial arts industry who've who have caught the attention of with my skills program. And they want on board to help make this dream a, uh, a possibility. So that's right now, that's where my passion is. Awesome. And is it too early to ask for information on that? If somebody wants to check that out? It is. Okay. Yes. All right. 20, well, 2018. Okay. Well, when that happens, folks, if, if you're listening to this in 2018, by all means, when you come back, you check out the show notes, whistlekick martial arts radio.com. Hopefully we'll have them updated. Please make sure you, you get me some links when it's time. And we'll update sure. the show notes and we'll look, make sure everybody knows. All right. Now, where can people find you? All, all the things you got going on. I know you're on social media. I know you've got websites. Let's have them. What, what's, what's the best place to find you online and everything you've got going? You can navigate everything that I have through my, my website, MelodySchumann.com. So it's M-E-L-O-D-Y and then Schumann, S-H-U-M-A-N. So I have a podcast series where I go over the stages of development of children. I talk about the behavior, positive behavioral teaching strategies um, that I touched on a little bit here. I talk as if I'm talking to the parents and talking to teachers and coaches, not just martial arts school owners and instructors. The benefit to that is that if you are a parent yourself 
or uh, you want to utilize those podcasts as uh, valuable resources for your parents or your schools, uh, that's great content. Um, I have a blog there. You can reach Skills, which is our children's martial arts consulting company. We actually uh, provide consulting. We write children's martial arts curriculum. We have a massive drills library that all of our content is broken up age specifically. Of course, it all integrates science and psychology into it. So it's definitely going to be very cutting edge, but highly effective if you're going to integrate some of those teaching strategies. And then I believe you can get to my social media pages uh, through that as well. Cause I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook. Uh, so, and of course you could search for me there as well by using my name. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your time today, everything that you've shared. And I'm hoping I could trouble you for one more bit. And that's the way that we always sign off. Some parting words of wisdom for the folks listening. Some parting words of wisdom. Okay. Well, let me let me wrap my head around this. When, when people ask me uh, what I do, especially, you know, I, I travel alone a lot by myself. I have to go to Chicago on Friday for a millionaire summit with some great martial arts and school owners and instructors. And, you know, I get on the airplane and people are like, what do you do? So instead of me telling people that I'm a martial arts instructor or children's martial arts uh, instructor, I tell them I'm a pediatric ninja specialist. And what it does is it makes people lean in and listen in and go, what is that? I want to hear more about that because utilizing something like pediatric ninja specialists is a very uncommon title to give myself. But that's really what I look at myself as, as a pediatric ninja specialist. So if you do, if you are a martial arts school or instructor and you're out networking and uh, you're out doing these school speeches or whatever you're doing to promote your business, try giving yourself a title that makes them lean in a little bit more. Because if you just say I'm a martial arts instructor, they may easily blow over it. But if you can get them to ask you questions about it, you're going to get them locked in a lot more. And I get a lot of new students that way, a lot of new connections that way uh, by utilizing that title. Professor Schumann is a woman whose heart and courage are just unquestionable. She rose to the occasion every time a challenge was in front of her. Despite her size, she still competed and managed a great deal of success there. I was struck by her passion for constant improvement and her desire to bring out the best of everyone around her, even a group that so many don't think of as capable, young children. Thank you, Professor Schumann, for your time today on the show. You can check out everything that we talked about, links, photos, social media, you name it, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 232. You can check out everything that we've got going on on social media at Whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We're, we're even doing some stuff on Google+. Plus. Now, you know, just trying to reach all of you wherever you might be. We'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. That comes right to me. And any of you that have emailed, no, I do write back. If you want to talk about the show with other listeners, check out Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio behind the scenes. That's a Facebook group. It's a private group. Request being added. And as long as you don't seem like some crazy stalker, spammer sort of person, we'll let you in. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.